Welcome to our session on blended learning for large groups. We live in a world that uses a lot of technology. This is a world that is ruled by Web 2.0. Handheld devices are become very common. So, can we include these kind of devices? Can we include technology in our daily classroom? Why not? Our session on blended learning will help you to bridge the two. Traditional learning along with technology enhanced learning. Let's look at blended learning in greater detail. When we talk of blended learning, there are three major components. You may use a combination of these components according to the situations that you are teaching in. The first component is the face-to-face -face session. This would include face-to-face -face classroom activities where there is a class and there is a teacher and both of them are interacting in real time. The teacher there acts as a facilitator. The second component of blended learning is the use of online learning material. This could include pre-recorded lectures that could have material that is developed by the teacher or alternatively material that is developed by a subject matter expert. You have a third component of blended learning, structured independent study time, where the learner spends time learning by himself or herself and this structured learning is guided by specially prepared study material. This could also include the development of certain skills. It could involve some amount of classroom experience. A wise teacher will judicially bend these three components of blended learning in order to have an effective classroom interaction. Let us now look at some approaches from blended learning that could be used for large classrooms. When we use blended learning in large classrooms, it could take one of these four forms. One, flipping the classroom. Two, using peer learning where online platforms like e-discussion boards, wikis or blogs are used. It could involve creating and sharing learning resources through e-portfolios and then using LMS which is a learning management system. You may use either one of these or more than one of these in combination to enhance the effectiveness of your blended learning class. Let us see how our classrooms can be flipped. But before we flip the classroom, let us look at the traditional classrooms that we are all used to. In a traditional classroom, you have a set timetable. The instructor goes into the class according to that set timetable. The teacher or the instructor teaches the class using lecture method mostly and at the end of that lecture method the teacher evaluates the student performance. Let us see how a flipped classroom differs from the traditional classroom. In a flipped classroom the material that the student has to learn is given to him or her beforehand. So the student looks at this learning material, goes through the learning material meticulously, has his own or her own doubts, questions, views regarding the learning material and then the student comes to class. The classroom time is now used for greater discussion, for application of the knowledge that is learned. Now this material that the student has referred to independently contains websites, it could be material from blogs, it could be in the form of videos and perhaps it could be a pre-recorded video of the teacher's lecture. With all this matter that the student has gone through, the student now enters the class. So thus you see, the cycle of learning has flipped. Whereas in a traditional classroom, it is the teacher who teaches 
and then the student gets evaluated. In case of a flipped classroom, the cycle has flipped in the sense that student learns on his or her own at home and comes into class ready for application of what has to be learned. We now look at some online platforms that can be used to ensure peer learning. A very important platform and a very useful platform to ensure peer learning is an e-discussion board. Many of these e-discussion boards are available freely. So as a teacher, what you need to do is create an e-discussion board for your class. Invite your students to be members of that discussion board. Now these e-discussion boards can be used to foster discussion among students. So students can pose questions, teachers can pose questions, and the entire class can respond to those questions. This need not be always in the form of questions. The teacher can even post a video. Or let us say the teacher can post a handout. Students go through the video, they go through the handout, they are invited to put their response, their views, their critiques on what they have seen or what they have read. Now what's the advantage of such an e-discussion board? In a traditional classroom, the teacher gets say 45 minutes for a lecture. And therefore, the amount of discussion is also curtailed, it is limited. In an e-discussion board, the teacher has no such kind of time limits and therefore a student can post his or her views at any time of the day. In a traditional class, students are shy, they are a bit hesitant to post their views. This doesn't happen with an e-discussion board. On an e-discussion board, you feel free to post your views. Students who lack language skills are definitely shy to voice their opinion in a class. On an e-discussion board, you can post your views without this kind of a fright lurking behind your mind. Another thing that happens in a normal classroom is that you have very limited students actually responding in the class. Very often the teacher herself or himself says, okay, that's enough and now I've got just five minutes left, we stop our discussion here. This doesn't happen on an e-discussion board. All the students in the class are free to respond. They are free to respond in their own words. They are free to respond at their own pace. A healthy thing about this kind of any discussion board is you build up on your peers' views. So when one of your friends has put down a comment or has started a discussion, it triggers off a set of ideas in your own mind and you can build upon that and post your views. In a traditional class, we often say to students, okay, you have answered, now you may sit down. Let's give a chance to that person there. On any discussion board, multiple views can be presented and you are not restricted about posting your views. Somebody can post 10 views and somebody else can give 20 views or 20 responses. Thus, e-discussion boards are a very healthy forum to enhance interaction and discussion amongst students. Oh yes, and that wasn't all. Another important thing about e-discussion boards is, you can always revisit your conversation. You can always revisit what you had written or posted and modify those views. In a normal classroom, we have restrictions and it's very difficult to get an expert come to class for every lecture and interact with your students. On an e-discussion board, you can always invite an expert to be part of your discussion board. Take this example. You are talking to your students about healthy food habits. It may not, you want to invite a dietitian or you want to invite a nutritionist to your class, but it may not be possible given your set regime. On an e-discussion board, nobody stops you. And you can invite one or more such kind of health experts to look at what has been posted by your students and maybe augment or change or give some kind of response to what the students have posted. That's the beauty of e-discussion boards. Just as e-discussion boards are very beneficial to learners, they are also beneficial to teachers. Looking at the views posted by the students, 
the teacher can understand to what extent the student has grasped the concept. So if there are any faulty concepts or if there are any faulty views that the students might have formed, the teacher can interrupt, the teacher can correct that student online. The teacher gets a view of how the students are progressing. Let's say there is a student who is very shy and who is not ready to post views. The teacher can contact that student individually without letting the rest of the class know and the teacher can motivate that one single student to post on the e-discussion board. Let us now see how blogs can be used in blended learning. A blog comes from two words, web log, which means you log your ideas onto a specially prepared page on the web. It's very easy to create such blogs and they are very economical. These blogs can be used to post videos, they can be used to post images, text or any such kind of matter that you think is useful to student learning. Let's explain it with an example. Consider for example, there is this teacher teaching English literature. And let's say the teacher is talking about Wordsworth's poetry. Now, you can understand Wordsworth's poetry if you know the background of the poetry. A lot of poems written by Wordsworth were written considering the place that he came from, the Lake District. Now, if you want your students to understand this poetry well, you might need to post certain videos, certain pictures of the Lake District. Posting such kind of videos, posting such kind of pictures or maybe even articles on that district will help the students to get the requisite background knowledge and then teaching that poetry will become much easier. Blogs are also useful to feature what students have done. For example, if the students have reviewed a particular book that is part of their curriculum, then students could write short synopsis of the books that they have reviewed. You could post those reviews on a blog, maybe even with a photograph of the student. This itself becomes motivating and the students like to learn through this way. Thus blogs could be made very interactive. Blogs even have scope for students or viewers to put their own comments. And all this material is stored you can give cross references and linkages and thus help to enhance the student's learning. Let us now look at wikis as a step to blended learning. The word wiki means quick. It's a Hawaiian word which means quick. And wikis can be used to encourage collaborative learning. This collaborative learning could be in the form of collaborative writing. Here's an example. Your students are students working on a project and they all need to produce what they have learned during the project, let's say in the form of a document. Since they have worked in a group, this will be a group project. So let us say four students are working on one aspect, another four students are working on another aspect, but then they need to collate that work. They need to put all that work together, to blend it together before they present it. Wikis are a wonderful way to bring about this kind of collaborative writing into reality. Wikis also allow us to provide links. Certain things may be available elsewhere on the World Wide Web. All that a teacher needs to do is to provide the right link. Students click the right link and get led to another page of course, outside the wiki, this will help to learn a topic by himself or herself. We can have students publish their own information and post it on the wiki. Take this example. You have a history class and the history class has gone around the city of Mumbai looking out for material related to the colonial times. And they have found this material in the form of architecture or maybe in the form of even the milestones that are there on the roads. They have photographs of these places and they have a short write-up about this place. 
So all this can be posted or published in the form of wikis where they can learn from one another. Another great feature of wikis is to connect with people within your class and even outside your class. For example, if it's a class of, let's say, students who are undergoing their teacher education program, either their B.Ed or their M.Ed. And they are interested in knowing what such kind of student teachers are doing in the rest of the world. So maybe a B.Ed class from a city of Mumbai can connect with a B.Ed class in Delhi or perhaps a B.Ed class in Australia. And this kind of hybridization of thoughts exchange of ideas and views is definitely going to be beneficial to all the three classes of learners. So thus, wikis are a wonderful way to extend the boundaries of your learning. Let us now see how e-portfolios can be used for blended learning. We are all familiar with the word portfolio. I'm sure you have heard of people showing you they are fashion portfolios. An e-portfolio in learning is very much like that. It is something where the student showcases what he or she has learned. The student's contributions in the form of PowerPoint presentations, articles written, or maybe a small flip book that is created, photographs taken, can all be put together in different areas of a portfolio. For example, a student of languages can include various articles written, maybe critiques of the pieces that are read, maybe logs of events attended. For example, if that student is attending, uh, let us say, a book review session or a book reading session or a drama, logs of such events could be included in the portfolio. Consider a student of history. The student of history can upload his or her experiences, could be photographs and videos of the places visited. This could perhaps include travelogues or even research that the student has carried out. A student teacher pursuing B.Ed or M.Ed can use an e-portfolio to upload his or her lesson plans, details of action research and videos of practical work. In addition to subject specific entries, your portfolios could also contain other things like community work that has been done. It could also have evidences regarding say the evaluation that you have undertaken and perhaps your participation in co-curricular activities. Let us now look at how an e-portfolio becomes useful to the learner and to others. Peers can visit each other's e-portfolios and have an understanding of what others have been doing. These portfolios need not be just confined to your own class. Let us say you are a student in XYZ pursuing your BA in history. There's another student in college ABC also pursuing his or her BA in history. When they look at one another's portfolios, they know what individual colleges are doing and in this way their learning gets augmented or it gets enhanced through each other's help. Yet another advantage of e-portfolios is when students graduate and they go in search of employment, your e-portfolio gives your prospective employers an idea regarding what you have done during your graduation years. So in a way, it is something that will make your CV very robust. So when you go for a job, carry your e-portfolio with you so that your employers know that this candidate has these, these skills. This candidate has gone through the following learning experiences. E-portfolios can be saved and they can be upgraded as you go from your graduation to maybe your post-graduation. Thus, it kind of looks like the learner's journey through a number of years. And how do you maintain these e-portfolios? You can create your own website, you can have blogs, 
to maintain your own individual e-portfolios. Let us now look at how Learning Management Systems, LMS, can be integrated into blended learning. For that, we first need to know what is an LMS. LMS or a Learning Management System is a software application which allows you to deliver course content through different means. That is, you could use videos, audios, web links. An LMS helps a teacher to track an individual's progress or maybe the progress of the entire group. An LMS is useful to collect and present data. Let me elaborate that point. For example, let us say the principal or the administrator is interested in knowing how your entire class has performed. An LMS can help you do that. An LMS is useful to perform online group or online individual activities. It helps students ask queries and instant feedback can be provided through an LMS. Here are some free and open learning management systems which are very popular among educators. You could use Moodle, Edmodo, Blackboard, Schoolology, Canvas, Google Classroom or Open Class. Let us now see how a teacher can use an LMS effectively as part of blended learning. An LMS fosters engagement between the teacher and students. It also fosters student to student engagement. And this can be done through instant messaging. Now, this instant messaging can be done for the entire group. Let's say you have a quiz coming up for them and you want all of your class to learn for the quiz. So an instant message can be posted on your LMS informing them a quiz on so and so date and this will be your topic. LMSs also help us send emails. These emails could be sent to the entire class. They could be sent to a select group within the class or they could be sent to individual students. For example, you had posted an assignment which you want them to submit it by a particular date. Let us say 10 students in your class have not submitted the assignment. So you need to send a reminder to just those 10 students. An LMS offers you this facility. An LMS can also serve as a discussion forum. We've already seen what e-discussion boards are. The similar kind of mechanism is followed in a discussion forum which is supported by an LMS. Yet another advantage of an LMS is it supports students' quizzes. These quizzes can be posted by the teacher. Students respond to them. Students can track their own progress. They can track the progress of their fellow classmates. The teacher can track the progress of one particular student or that of the entire class. One advantage of such kind of quizzes is the teacher can look at his or her own style of creating evaluation techniques. For example, the teacher has set a quiz and the teacher finds that while everybody is able to answer multiple choice questions, students find it difficult say to answer fill in the blank type of questions. The teacher can introspect and find out what could be the possible reasons for this and maybe the next time he or she is teaching, he or she can improve the teaching process so that all students are able to do well in the forthcoming quiz. An LMS has some special features. In a traditional classroom, it is one teacher dealing with an entire group of students. On an LMS, multiple teachers could be invited and thus you can draw from the expertise of various teachers. It can be made even more beautiful by getting in teachers who have a lot of experience in the field and learning from their own rich experience. 
So students benefit from a number of teachers when an LMS is used. An LMS supports information. Just as you have a notice board in your college which displays information about forthcoming events, so is it in case of an LMS. An LMS provides you information about all forthcoming activities that you have planned for your class. This is good because a student can refer to the calendar and thus make provision for these activities in his or her own schedule. In a normal classroom, in a traditional classroom, it's very difficult to involve stakeholders to be part of the educational process. An LMS gives you this opportunity. So, prospective employers could be part of your LMS. Parents could be part of the LMS. Educational authorities, administrators could be part of an LMS. They could be silent observers just observing what students are doing. Let me explain this with an example. Let us say you are a teacher teaching psychology and your principal is interested in knowing what kind of student interaction you have in your class. The principal can be a silent observer. He or she is part of the group using that LMS and the principal can see how each student responds, who are the students who are posting often, who are the students who come up with some novel ideas or novel views. So thus stakeholders, those who are interested in the educational process can be a very important part of the learning process. Here are a few advantages of using an LMS. One LMS can be used to create multiple courses and thus interlinking between these courses is possible. It is also possible for you to reuse the same material. Let us say you are a teacher of history and you have taught something like museology to the first year students. A certain part of it is also there in the third year content. So content that was created for your LMS of first year students can easily be exported to the content that is created for your third year students. Thus, duplication of teacher's work is avoided. In a regular class, it is very difficult to find time to go beyond the syllabus. Our time is restricted, examinations are close at hand and therefore teachers often find themselves rushing to complete the syllabus. An LMS offers you the opportunity to go beyond the course content. After all, there are students in your class who always want to know something more. An LMS is a wonderful platform to give them extra inputs on whatever they are learning. We are concerned about students who lag behind the average class. Due to time constraints, it's not possible to take those students and deal with them on a one-is-to-one -one basis. But remedial coaching can easily be offered when you use an LMS. So if a particular student has a problem with certain content area, he or she can be offered special coaching, remedial coaching by use of an LMS. You can also cater to different learning styles. For those students who want to learn using visual means, use plenty of images, pictures and videos. If your students are happy learning through auditory means, then you can use audios, taped lectures and so on. There will be a few learners who want to read through text material and absorb what they are learning. Then in such a case, useful links to websites or text material or maybe even online books would be the right material to be provided. Thus, since we have different people learning through different ways, all of them can be accommodated using an LMS. You can upload content in various forms. These forms could be in the form of audio, visual content, text content. Another advantage of using an LMS is to give students to something called as virtual laboratories. The same experiments that are done in real-time laboratories 
can be replicated using a virtual laboratory. These are very economical because you can repeat the same experiment over and over again till you are satisfied with the way you are performing the experiment. The teacher can use an LMS to grade the students and this grading is available to the teacher in case the teacher has to classify students, in case the teacher has to provide remedial coaching, such kind of information is always beneficial to a teacher. The teacher's energy and time are saved. For example, if you have taught a course during a particular year, you have created content for that course, the next year all you need to do is look at that content, maybe upgrade it slightly, fine tune it based on your experiences from the time that you last use it and thus a refined course can be created for your future learners. But it does save a lot of time and energy for the teachers. An LMS provides 24 by 7 access to learning material. A student can learn anytime, anywhere because the student can learn on his or her own mobile. You can learn at home, you can learn when you are traveling, you can learn in the library, in the classroom, thus 24 by 7 access is provided to all the course material. Successful use of blended learning depends upon a few precautions that you take. So what are the points to be noted? Teachers need to seek the right blend of activities. How do you get the right blend of activities? Keep in mind the objectives of your learning session. Keep in mind the kind of learners that you will be facing. Keep in mind the interests and the needs of those learners, the time you have on hand and thus choose your own array of activities to make blended learning successful. When we talk of using the right blend of activities, here is an example. Consider this biology teacher who is teaching about tissues in plants. Now, that teacher might have planned for some objectives that involve developing the skill of making slides to observe tissues. In such a case, a video can be used to demonstrate how to make a slide that has to be observed under a microscope. Then, the teacher can give a link to a virtual laboratory where a simulation of the same is offered. But let us remember that the teacher wants to inculcate this skill in the students and therefore actual preparation of the slide must include a hands-on experience in the laboratory. Thus, using a right blend of learning experiences is extremely necessary. Examples are wonderful to make students learn. But then what kind of examples should we use? Let these be examples that are related to the real life of students. Let these be examples where the student can easily relate to. These examples need to be examples where the student is interested. Have examples that deal with previous experiences of the learners. Good blended learning makes use of activities. These activities could be individual activities, they could be activities in small groups, they could be activities that are conducted face to face or activities that are conducted online. So when you have blended learning, make sure that you have a variety of activities integrated into your learning plan. Learning becomes meaningless if feedback is not provided to the learner. Provide instant feedback. This feedback could be individual, it could be group feedback. Individual feedback should be given very carefully. Avoid scolding, insulting or such kind of feedback that will make the learner feel small. It is said that you praise in public but you reprimand quietly. So if you have to correct somebody, do it in such a way that his ego is not hurt. If you use blended learning, especially if you use an LMS, you can award badges to the students. 
and these are great incentives to learning. For example, you can award a badge to the most creative answer. You can award a badge to the best question that was posed. You can give a badge, let us say, to a student who has been most helpful in answering other students' doubts. When we work in an online environment, let us remember that all students are not necessarily tech savvy. Therefore, make sure that your student has understood the nitty gritties or the little intricacies of the online environment. Make sure that they know how to log on to your online classroom. There are certain rules and regulations that they need to follow. There is a certain set of etiquette that the students need to bear in mind. So all this orientation should be given to the students before they start using blended learning. The students need hands-on experience and therefore some practice sessions may be given to them so that blended learning is effectively used. The students need to get familiar with the interface that is being used. With the tech savvy students that we have today, this is not difficult, yet it is the responsibility of the teacher to make them understand the entire interface so that we use blended learning most effectively. Thus you see, blended learning is a wonderful tool. It's like an Aladdin's magic lamp in our hands. How we use it depends upon ourselves. Let us use blended learning effectively so that we can help our students achieve all the learning goals that we have for teaching a particular content. Happy blended learning.